right, so you thank you for joining us here on ITV for TMI this wonderful morning. I am Uyi Agmofwebe. As always, uh, this morning we'll be uh, discussing topical issues uh, here on the program. We'll be looking at issues uh, that shape this country on a day-to-day -day basis, particularly as we head towards the 2019 general election. Uh, conversations are building up along that line, of course, across sectors, and of course, uh, everybody's lending their voice to these conversations. But there are key elements in the conversations we can't uh, overlook, and the importance of such issues uh, also cannot be overemphasized. And one of those areas we'll be looking at on the program this morning is the counterinsurgency effort. Of course, that's in the northeastern part of uh, Nigeria. That fight has been uh, a long time coming. Some persons have even said the fight has been uh, long drawn out. Uh, this is something that ought to have been concluded and uh, something that should have been uh, history uh, by now. But as it turns out, it's obvious that that fight is taking much longer than some persons would have expected. Let's get talking on the program this morning and I'll be joined by two gentlemen uh, to help uh, make sense of this conversation. But first, uh, this morning, I'm joined by somebody who not only has sizable experience uh, for a long time in the Nigerian Army, but also uh, happens to be a retired colonel, someone who retired as colonel in the Army in 1976. And that's quite some time, really. So we're going to uh, make the most of his uh, experience, his background uh, on the program this morning to help us create context uh, for the discussion we're going to have uh, regarding the counter-resurgency initiatives uh, up there in the northeastern part of the country. Colonel Paul Obebo retired. Thank you for coming on the program. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. You know, when you talk about uh, uh, the Nigerian issue, uh, the corruption and uh, the insurgency problem uh, appear to be two major concerns that most Nigerians have. But let's pay more attention to uh, the issue of uh, counterinsurgency. What's your candid assessment of this fight so far? To understand the subject matter, let's ask ourselves what is the role of the military. Mm. Okay. Uh, the role of the military is to hold the ground. Mm. Okay. In holding the ground, that's where many people uh, understand it to be defending the country. Right. Defending the country. All right. There are a lot of, under the military doctrine, a lot of uh, combat doctrines, mm. combat strategy. So when we talk of insurgency, insurgency by definition is group of citizens of that country picking up, picking up arms to overthrow that government. And the, the citizens picking up, picking up arms, they should be civilians. If we were to be military men, it would be called coup. Mm. Okay. So when civilians, some set of civilians, pick up arms against their government, with the purpose of taking over, of controlling that government, there is insurgency. When you look at the present scenario, the Boko Haram mm. that is waging war against the country, is it with the aim of overthrowing that government? Is it with the aim of throwing Nigerian government? All right. If you look at it in depth, uh, it's, it's a mix-up, a very mix-up. Mm. Okay. But we drop that one for the main time. Right. And if it is insurgency and the military now coming, okay, then it's a different dimension. The military will come in because it is insurgency, anti insurgency should be by the police. Really? Yes, not by the military. So, so why don't we have that kind of situation? Wait, let, I'm explaining. That mm -hmm. is why you have the military police. Mm -hmm. That's why they are armed. There is their training. Okay? All right. But where 
the issue is beyond the military police. It is then the military coming, either the army, the air force, or the navy. It is only when they come. In. After clearing, after subduing those uh, insurgents, they withdrew. They withdrew immediately. Go back to their barracks, and here the police will come in again and take over and maintain peace. Okay, all right. But in Nigeria situation, in respect of uh, Boko Haram, if you look at it, this is these are non Nigerian civilians. Okay, and many of them are non Nigerians. So this is where something coming. Okay. <clears throat> and under the military doctrine, this is called, it should, it should be captioned, it should come in under external, mm. okay, external invasion. This is what we have in this country today, okay. I don't know why up to now the country has not come up to say we are fighting external invasion. I thought it should be, because they come under different compact doctrines. Insurgency is what we call city fight, close quarter battle. And the police is supposed to come in and start. It's only when it's too much for the police that the military should come in. After that one, they should quickly withdraw back to their barracks and the police should maintain peace. Okay, but what we are seeing now is that they come in, they take over areas and fly their flag. So it's not a civil war. It's worse than the civil war. It's worse than the civil war. Mm. Okay? So this is uh, external invasion. It's war of invasion that we are fighting as of today. And I think the country should not be shy about it. They should declare it. Okay? And then uh, start with police action. Police action is the lowest rate of war. Okay, but we think we should be able to do it very quickly and push them out and then go back to work. Like Nigerian civil war. It started with police action. But what we found that the our brother who were in the east, they were very serious. They have subsequent arms. This is why I want to declare a civil war. Okay. So, uh, to be able to handle this thing perfectly and withdraw, okay, finish with it. Uh, we should, I think the country should declare, we should look at it as external invasion. Just yesterday, as, just yesterday uh, yes. President Muhammad Buhari touched down in Brunei State in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. Uh, he, he, has, he has been there talking with the uh, troops, uh, talking with, with of course, uh, the leadership of the military in this country. He has talked about how that uh, Nigeria needs to, re the army in itself will have to re-strategize regarding the fight against uh, the, the Boko Haram. Do you think so far the strategies have worked? Because obviously they've not. That's the reason he's talking about re-strategizing. But what does it mean at this point in time, given the peculiarity of this fight itself and the challenge it poses for the country, for us to re-strategize? Um, Buhari is a war horse. Mm. <laughs> he is very experienced in war. When there was such uh, incident, very much incident, and it was the GOC of 3D, mm. what it did was to move his headquarters from Joss to Mediburi. And pursue them, you know, beyond Nigerian border into other countries. Okay, until those countries now through the UNO appeal to Nigerian government and they came in before he would drop back, okay, to uh, be uh, within Nigerian uh, border. Okay, all right. What he said is that. What we are fighting is not insurgency. <laughs> That's what you say. Mm. Okay? When you say you should strategize, the combat mode we have been using is that of insurgency. 
But we're not fighting subjects. We are fighting, okay, external invasion. And external invasion is full flare war. If external is invasion, those people fighting, how do they get the sort of the weapons they are using? And I was reading a few days ago that the military, the U.S. government has warned Nigeria government that the Boko Haram they are planning to use drones. Mm. Okay, and from what I read from the soldiers involved in that battalion, those who wanted to escape, he said the sort of weapon they use. Okay, he said Nigerian government don't have it. Where do they get those weapons? Right, these are weapons acquired from Libya up to Syria. Okay. The the dissidents who ran away from Liberia, other war occupied area, they regrouped. Okay. And those are the people fighting in Nigeria today. Mm -hmm. Will be today. Okay, we're just going to take a quick break uh, yes. now. Uh, Colonel Obebo, uh, you are making a very brilliant presentation of the whole situation as it is. Uh, we're going to take a quick break now. I will be back shortly, and then Colonel Obebo will continue uh, on this tragedy. Do stay with us. Thank you for staying with us. Uh, just a while ago, we got joined by another guest on the program, uh, Felix Sussereme. He's a lecturer at the Department of International Studies and Diplomacy uh, here at the University of Benin. Thank you for coming on the program. Thank you, thank you very much. I'm just going to come right to you in a moment. But let me uh, come back to uh, uh, Colonel Obebo. You were just uh, making a point about re-strategizing uh, so we can uh, become more effective uh, in this fight. Uh, would you want to continue uh, that conversation? Yes, uh, as I've said, the war of evasion is what we are fighting today. Not insurgency. Not insurgency. Insurgency, if I may repeat, is when a group of civilians mm. or citizens take up arms against their government with the hope or with the aim of overthrowing their government so that they can take over. This is not what is happening in this country today. People fighting in this country today, there might be some Nigerians, right. but from the context, there are some foreigners, and the sort of weapons they are using, okay, they couldn't have had access to it if there is no foreign content in it. So this is why this sort of war we have in Nigeria today, or the problem we have in Nigeria should be today, should be categorized under war of, his, uh, war of evasion, mm. where you have people coming in to harm the country or to subdue the country or to take over. Okay. All right. Now, Mr. President was in notice a few days ago, and he said the military should start to strategize. Mm. I believe what he meant by that is that the nomenclature should be changed. Mm. Instead of insurgency, right. it should be war of evasion, war of, uh, uh, of evasion. However, it's too late in the day to, to pronounce that one, okay? The combat doctrine that should be applied now should be like the military police. That what he applied during the time of medicine. And he got results. And he got results, okay? Because he, he pursued them, okay? Although there were some Nigerian contents in it, but he waged war against them, war, a police war, and pursued them outside Nigeria about 20 kilometers outside Nigeria into other, the borders of other countries. I think that's what we should do. Okay. And I'm happy that uh, immediately he came, the first thing he did was to have meetings. Okay. To confer with countries around Nigeria. Mm. And he's calling for that again. They are going to, they are going to be having that meeting anytime. Today or the, they have that meeting today, to, yes. the Multinational Joint Task yes. Force. And he happens to be the chairman of he the Lecture the Basin Commission. Yes. And I'm sure they're going to change their doctrine. Okay. I'm sure they're going to change to police action. Let me allow you to catch your breath a little, Colonel yes. Obebo. Yes. Let me come back to Mr. Sarime. Uh, some persons have uh, insinuated conspiracy theory in the fight against insurgency. And you are an academic. You've taught on this time and again. What are you, what are you learning and what are you teaching about this? Interestingly, we 
took the wrong perspective from the onset. Uh, if I'm permitted, let me take it back a bit mm. to times before now. I can give you two very funny scenarios. One is way down history in old Sumer. They were a group called the Arcadians. In fact, they were specialized in assassination. They were making a good living from being assassins. And they had a formal, very funny code. The assassin's code they used was, live free, die well. Mm. I'm setting the stage. We'll go to 1812, Napoleon Bonaparte, Emperor of France, Lord of Europe. Napoleon had a problem in Spain. And what was the problem in Spain? The Spanish began to revolt against Napoleon's rule. And it was not the regular army that they used. In fact, if they had used regular army, Napoleon would have crushed them immediately. They were fighting the French army from door to door. That was what brought the concept of guerrilla war mm. into modern warfare. Napoleon called it the small ulcer. And you know what the ulcer does to your stomach? It will bite you from within. So if we take these two scenarios, the Nigerian government started with the concept of denial, the concept of disregard, the concept of the military describing the civilian as a bloody civilian. So when you set the stage very well, you will see that from the time of Obasanjo, just after we came into this current democratic dispensation, Boko Haram has started. But then it was more of a discontented group mm. within the territory of oppression, which is totally known as the visit of interest. Just in Borno State, it was not properly managed. It began to spiral. And the content of revolution that makes it very dangerous to manage is when awareness has spread far and wide. So people began to believe in radicalization. The government was far from the civil society, the civil populace. So when the matter began to escalate, it was seen more like this ragtag group mm. that can easily be flushed out using the siege mentality of the military, believing that civilians are bloody civilians, they just drafted the military. Of course, the police started the problem, messed it up, the military was called in. The military in Nigeria has always been used to clean up the mess of other sectors. Unfortunately, when they got to the theater of activity, they came in again with that military mentality, where you see that every Nigerian is supposed to be afraid of a soldier. The soldier that is now using the analog mentality is going to a digital environment, where Boko Haram that started as a discontented group, mm. a religious group, began to plant bombs, bomb government installations, began eventually to attack both mosque and church. And I once said in a television program that people were confusing Boko Haram purely as a religious group. I said, no. They were asking for a definition of the political space. Mm. So if you take it from there, it will mean, therefore, that we should be very, very conversant with the people we are dealing with. It, it was more of two societies in one. We here, we believe that they are fighting there. It's their business there. It's not their business there. It's a national problem. It's a national security threat. And politics now entered the argument. Of course, trust politicians. Blame game is their hobby. Oh, it is you. It is this. It is that. They were not looking at the big picture. What is the big picture? The big picture is that this will affect everybody in the long run right. until the attempt on the police headquarters and United Nations building in Abuja. It now became clear that the thing has left the Northeast. A student of mine just completed a project and the topic we were discussing was the failure of national security. Mm. And um, sitting here, I will, I will quickly mention two professors in my department that their academic works have given us some insight into this problem which will lead to where I'm going to analyze this issue differently. Now, Professor Benzo Sadolo has been teaching insurgency. He's a specialist on Guinea history and a specialist on military tactics. Most of the time, we don't engage people who have taken time to study in addressing critical problems. That is one deficiency. We are looking at it more like a military matter. It is a deficiency that will come up to later. Professor Leo Toide's inaugural lecture was, he is a professor of diplomatic history, mm -hmm. and his inaugural lecture had to do with Nigeria's international boundaries. And the key word that he mentioned in that inaugural lecture was that Nigeria is surrounded by French speaking countries. 
these French-speaking countries have defense agreement with France. Right. Who do we have a defense agreement with? Nigeria as a country. We don't, we don't even have with our neighbors. We don't even know our neighbors very well. And our borders are very porous. If you have ever traveled by land route outside Nigeria, particularly Seme, Ode, and the other parts, it's almost as if if you hold 500 naira, you can walk across. Of course, the security system is there. You see them when they are actually trying to show off. But the detailed consciousness, the kind of response you see on the other side, you don't really easily see it on our Nigerian side. Mm. And it is even worse in northern part of the country. In fact, it's almost as good as open house. Because I have been to Meduguri, I have been to Mubi, I have been to, in fact, I have spent some time in Adamawa State, so I know that background a bit, and I've traveled in that area. And I see this tendency, all you need to do, you can speak either Hausa or Fulani or Kanuri, you just walk across. So it is also very easy, therefore, because of the porous nature of our borders in that area, then the Lake Chad, which is not probably manned, mm. there were gaps. And these gaps were not properly filled in. So there has been no synergy. The strategy has been the strategy of let me claim glory for my side. Let me take the, the, the credit for doing this. Let me. If the government of the day had followed the trajectory already set by the past administration, where they use the multinational task force, if they had continuously used that method, this thing would have been locked in by now. Because actually, the vicinity of interest is defined. Mm. It is mostly Bornu states and the Lake Chad region, where we have Sambisa forest. Sure. Of course, this place is vast. But Nigeria is also a very big country. Mm. Initially, it was leave them to steal their own Just as happened in France in 1789, when there was a revolution, the king was having problems with his citizens. Other European kings said, leave him, let him steal in his own juice. By 1791, the French revolutionaries made a declaration that was very interesting. And they said, all governments are our enemies. All people are our friends. Meaning, if you are the people, join us. If you are the government, you are our enemy. So the other European kings now made the declaration of peace in 1791, saying that you should not harm the king of France. But then it was too late. Something had already come out of Pandora's box. So the government should have looked at this thing in a strategic manner. So as it stands today, would, would you categorically say the government is overwhelmed? <laughs> we, we, we would have been discussing something as if they have not been overwhelmed. After the Metele massacre, mm. as of yesterday, there was another attack on Kawa, but the army repaired that one successfully. Now, now th this is a problem. Why are we always talking of army, army, army? We have navy, we have air force, we have civil defense, we have police. We have left this thing almost as if it's the business of the military. It's not just it's not the business of the military alone. You need to put everything you have to bear. Mm. There must be collaboration. All the units, DSS, every group, the civilian force, the one we call civilian JTF, they've done so well so far helping the military with underground food. The military, we, we, I keep hearing this argument that our military is not familiar with the terrain. It's embarrassing. You cannot say that in 2018. That is not correct. Going back to the point I made about Nigeria having defense agreement, Nigeria can buy intelligence, but we are not using intelligence in this matter. We are playing politics. And this is the end game where Vukama, they will write a letter. They will send signal to the military that they are coming for them, and they will actually come for them. That, that is the height of embarrassment. In fact, it, it is a national embarrassment that in 2018, the Nigerian government is aware that military, the military were informed by a group, a terrorist group, known worldwide as the most violent. Boko Haram, after IC, now because IC has been downgraded, mm. Boko Haram is now holding that position. They are even worse than Taliban. And they will write to the army that they are coming to attack. They will really come and attack them. I mean, draw the line very well. Does that sound very interesting? Because they, they have the argument of, as I said at the beginning, that live free, die well. They want to die. Mm. It is part of their rhetoric. The fundamentalist argument is that when they die, they are going to paradise. So they want to go to paradise. Do you want to go to paradise with them? No. So how do you now prevent that desire from being actualized? How do you get support from the personalities around the local communities that have been estranged from governments, from government, from the reality of life in a modern nation? that are now beginning to see that there is a contest and they will likely be, be swinging to the side of the one that holds the mace, which is for now Boko Haram, because Boko Haram is still 
more on ground. The military, when they come in, they are coming from, they are coming with the mentality of an outsider. They have not used enough intelligence. They should begin to infiltrate. Boko Haram infiltrates Nigerian army faster than Nigerian army is infiltrated Boko Haram. If not, we would have been seeing a different scenario. We would have been talking of the army being able to neutralize a potential attack. You hear that the Air Force has been able to identify a particular location where they were mustering and they were neutralized. You hear that the Navy used their, their resources to go through the lake charge and they were able to lock down Boko Haram in a particular place. You will hear all these stories. Boko Haram, they have sniper units. I'm not saying we should be doing everything they do, but we should even be proactive. They are bringing... To so run circles around them. Yeah, they are bringing the fight to us now. And this is the same Boko Haram that the government is always saying that they have decimated them. They have now become attackers of soft targets. So we were singing the song of glory too early, the song of victory. The battle may have been won. The war is not over. And take it back to President Bush of the USA after September 11. 11. He said something. He said the war against terror is a long drawn war that will go into the dark mm. and that a lot of things will be revealed. The Nigerian government should begin to be more open, more engaging. Half of what people know about Boko Haram activity now is from social media, not from government. In fact, we hardly actually even believe government media. Because government media will always kind of that. I, I know they have social responsibility to downplay threats. Yes, but when you are downplaying threats, give us something real to hold on to so that they will be on your side. Boko Haram is doing better. Imagine this last one in Metele. If it is true, that video that we have seen on social media, as they were shooting the soldiers, they were recording it. That means they came with an objective and terrorists thrive on publicity. Of course, as soon as that happened, they would have uploaded it. And this is the same Boko Haram when they started in the notice from around 2009 when they became actually very hostile to the government. Mm. One of the things they went after were the base stations of the different telecommunication agencies. They first of all brought down communications. They know the even the track on here knows very well that in the military the critical element is command and control. Communication. So how come we cannot tap into their communication system? How come we cannot anticipate? Let, let me give you uh, a while to, to, to rest a bit and come back to Colonel Ogbebo. Mm -hmm. Time and again, government has told us that uh, Boko Haram has been technically defeated. You want to walk us through that? <laughs> you see, Boko Haram is not a country. Hmm. How did they start? What is Boko Haram? In 2009, there were some people agitating. They want special dispensation. They were jealous of what was happening in Niger Delta. Okay, where the government was paying so much attention and giving money. They wanted to have such a situation too. And this is how they started agitating. Unfortunately, those were arrested were sent to the to the police uh, uh, barrack or police post, about hundred of them. And intelligence had it that they were all shot. Okay. And this is how those people who survived now carry their news outside Nigeria to fundamentalist, religious fundamentalists, that Nigerians are killing religious people. They don't want Islam, they don't want uh, Islam religion again in Nigeria. This is how they were able to gain sentiment. And you have, you know, most of our neighbors, especially to the north, they are, they practice Islam religion. This is how the KB are reinforced them. At the time they came in, they found Nigeria was a soft ground. They didn't come in to occupy Nigeria. They came in to recruit Nigerians. They came in to, 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 to mobilize, to take logistics, food, money, other things from Nigeria. 
That was their aim, not to occupy any place. Okay. And they were doing that very well. Unfortunately, there was no military person at the head of the government. This is why in America, you must have some military background before you can, before you can become president. We don't have such in that area. And the situation was misread. The game, uh, the blame game came. Who did this one? Who did do that one? And that one gave him opportunity now to hold it, to start taking the ground. And within a short time, they overrun about 40 the local government, flying their flag. Okay. That was not the initial aim. But because they found that. There was confusion on the ground, and that is how they started occupying. This Boko Haram is not a country. Mm -hmm. A group of people came. So, if you are going to wage war against them, who do you wage war against? Your neighbors? <laughs> okay? So, what we were doing by then was trying to bargain. But who were the people bargaining? They were not true Nigerians. There were not people interested in Nigeria. Okay. And what happened? They started taking more ground and more ground and started eating both soft and hard objects. Luckily, the government changed and Buhari came. He understand. Okay. He was involved before during the time of participation. What he did was now saying, Boko Haram, you cannot say this is where they occupy. They are like, eh. So we started making friends with neighboring countries. We started bringing them in. We were the pay, they weren't paying the money. Okay, we started bringing them in. And this is how we now have these international joint, force, joint forces. And we've done very well. Okay, we changed the military narrative. The, the, the different commanders were the most brought the new commanders. And you can see within two years what we achieved. The 12 local governments or 14 local governments that was in their hands have been taken back. As of today, entire Nigeria were in charge. Okay. All right. What you have now, these are reflex actions. Okay. As uh, my co debater said, he said they believe in propaganda. What they do now is they look for a soft place and hit. Take photographs and spread it around to see we are still existing. Okay. It happened everywhere. Many theater. If you remember what happened in Uwere, it's part of that being civil war. Okay. Uwere was around there. During the Second World War, the Japanese also did it to the to Boba. And they are, it happened. This is why a strategy, you don't leave soldiers in the war front for too long. You, you pull them out at one. Otherwise, they become fatigued. They have what we call war fatigue. And that might degenerate to hysteria. That is why you find soldiers revolting in the northeast. Sometimes they go. Okay. Soldiers fight after six months. We draw them and put in first soldiers. Mm -hmm. okay. But we, uh, instead of doing that one, what the present government did was very brilliant. The whole of Northeast used to be under just three division by then. But if nearly a body came, he now set up. Or uh, you now set up another division. So you have seven divisions in Meduguri now. So they are in charge of the whole of that area. Okay. And this is why Boko Haram cannot really fight any serious fight now. They can only do uh, guerrilla warfare. Go and hit in a place and go back and make it. Let's talk about military, uh, let's talk about intelligence gathering. Yes. Uh, a lot of uh, military uh, intelligence analysts have said that we have a whole lot of work to do in terms of intelligence gathering. 
On top of all that, there have also been allegations of how that intelligence is more often than not compromised from elements on the inside. What are you hearing about that, basically? You see, intelligence gathering in war, mm. you normally use the people on the ground. Right. They are the natives. Okay. But in the case of Boko Haram, it's not a country. It's not an organized society you can deal with. Okay. These are pockets of uh, invaders who come in, hit hard, and withdraw. So intelligence in this case is a bit difficult. They are not living in a place. When they decide to say they want to hit uh, ITV, few people will gather, they come here, sneak here, and do their thing and withdraw. And, and apparently they can't hit ITV. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm not using <laughs> an example. Scenario. <laughs> scenario. 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 Okay. It's okay. So in this case, they are very fluid. Mm. Okay. You they can't put a finger on where exactly they, they are. Put a finger. Mm. So to Nigeria government has done in the last three years, they will done what is supposed to have be done. Mm. Okay? And that is cultivating the neighbors. Okay? Make them believe that you are porous. Mm. Okay? Join us to guard the borders. These are our fights now. These are fights. Mm. And that is the best you can do under that scene. I, I think Mr. Sarebe wants to react to that quickly. Yes. Uh, I disagree with what my coach going to say. On a very strong note, mm. let me take it back a bit. The multinational joint task force was not created by the current government. It was the initiative of the outgoing government. Remember, the election was shifted because of this Boko Haram matter. Even though we, we heard at the time that there was political undertone to that yes, shift. Yes, that was the initial claim from the opposition that is now the government of the You see, this is why I said blame game became the issue. They missed the line. The insurgency is not um, about APC or PDP. It's about Nigeria as a corporate entity. Obasanjo's time was when this thing started. It was not taken seriously. It was taken, they, they waved it off as if those people, just the way you believe that when poor riot, you just send police and so to brutalize them. That was the concept of addressing this matter. It was not addressed as a serious matter. It was in the same mindset that the police could use extrajudicial measures to unilaterally eliminate Yusuf. And he was actually the man that was keeping the band together. Now let's come to the conspiracy theory you mentioned earlier on, which means that some insiders could have created a situation that would become a Frankenstein monster. That's we are right. not running away from that. In fact, this thing started in Nigeria here. Suddenly, Bono, I have old students who are not colleagues. Uh, can I come in here? Yes, I've already said so. Yes, I, I'm, 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 I'm building. I'm so. You made a point. Yes. Yes. You made a point. I'm not, I'm, I'm not arguing the point. It sir. is the annihilation mm. of the killing Good. of this man. Exactly. Good. Yes. Made it to sell. Mm. The that, that's the point I'm pushing. And one sentiment. Yes. I'm, I'm pushing it forward now. Right. That I even have a former student who is now a lecturer who served in that area. And I, I, I have also seen soldiers who went to theater of operation. I have had contact with academics and others who watch programs on TV, we listen to discussions. But the, 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 the critical element has been the government did not take it seriously. And the government believed because we can always push people to where they want to. Yeah, please, can I come here again? Yes, sir. You see, it is the waging of war is by politicians. It's not by the military. Mm. It is the politicians who say we are declaring war. And this is the sort of war we are declaring. That's where I agree with you. We made mistake right from the beginning by giving it a name which is incorrect. And what I started with. The because war we are fighting so today is not insurgency. No, as at that time, it was an insurgency. This, this is the point I'm also still making out that Yusuf and his people were not happy with the way they were treated by the government. Mm. And they saw the agencies of government as corrupt, as unreliable. That was why they started attacking police stations, they didn't start with military barracks. They started with police stations and government offices. They didn't go to the military. It was only the military. The military was brought here. I also said that I said, the military has always been brought to clean up the mess made by others. But when the military came in, they also took a wrong cue using this occupation mentality. They didn't come in to embrace the people, to say, oh, we have, we know there's a problem. Uh, can, I, can, I, can I come in here again? Okay. I think we're on a different frequency here. 
You see, the police came in. This is what mobile police is trained for. Now you talked about the military police earlier. Yes. Mm. The, 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 no, the, the, the mobile, mobile police. police. Mobile it's police. Anti-riots. Anti -riots. Anti -riots. Yes, yes anti-riots. Anti mm. Okay. All right. At the time a decision was taken, okay, it was decided that it was a surgency. And if it's a surgency, it, it, it's a question of putting down the problem and going back to your barracks. The ground was not occupied. And this is why they were quickly, they quickly moved, Boko Haram quickly moved and occupied 14 local governments. And that was a whole lot. That was a whole lot. Mm. But if the correct nomenclature, if the correct doctrine was applied, it could have been police action right from the beginning. In that case, the soldiers could have been able to come in, fight, and hold the ground. Well, well this is where <laughs> operational matters are purely military. Mm. Meanwhile, the strategic matters are purely intellectual, academic, and political. Now, this is the synergy that has been missing. You evaluate the situation. You, there, there's tactics, there's strategy. Tactics is immediate. You apply it as it's going on. Mm -hmm. Then you begin to review strategy as the situation is developing. Mm -hmm. When the military was brought in, it was because the police was overwhelmed. This is the mentality we still use even during elections. You bring military to come and be monitoring elections. When you deploy forces and you stretch them too thin, you will have a big problem on your hand. And as we kept hearing, which is not acceptable, which I don't even feel comfortable with, that the military, they are not used to the terrain. This is Nigeria. This is Nigeria Army. <laughs> and it is very embarrassing. I use the word embarrassing because I studied geography in secondary school. And beyond what I was taught, I look at maps. I, I look at, I see, I see use maps to teach today in history classes. Because I know the value of being able to give visuals to other cognitive issues. If the military was brought in, they were brought in to suppress the so-called insurgents mm -hmm. at that time. They were insurgents because they were not military. They were civilians that were in a state of unrest against the existing government. But they had an ideology which the government did not immediately recognize as dangerous. What is the real meaning of Boko Haram? Where sanitation is seen. That is the translation. They, in the actual world, they say they are a jihadist group, the Salafist group. Before they started splitting into different groups, with them made it a hydra headed monster. Before they now gained international affiliation with IC, with Akeda, our government was playing politics. And this is dangerous. I said intelligence is very expensive just now. We are paying, buying proper intelligence. In fact, we, we, we still believe it's business as usual. Some people are even happy. They are making money from it. So they want the status quo to remain? If possible for them, mm. which is very sad. But again, look at technology of 2018. You, if you see movies like Eye in the Sky, the American army attendants, they don't go to an area until they have enough intelligence. And the person that is looking at you is right up there in the sky. It's a satellite. It has high definition cameras that can zoom down to a pin on the ground. I've seen a lot of movies like that. I've had this course, I've read books. Of course, this is 2018, so you don't even need to go into the military to know how military tactics. It's only the operational part you don't know as a non military personnel. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the situation, you can also visualize and let, let's talk about morale, uh, Mr. Sherman. Let's talk about morale for our men, for the troops on the ground there. Uh, there have always been allegations and counter allegations that the resources that are supposed to be plowed into taking care of these men, ensuring uh, they are fit for the task that's in front of them, uh, would often end up in private pockets. Uh, yes. As I said, allegations and counter allegations. But just yesterday in Borneo State, right in the presence of the military authorities and, of course, the uh, president himself, uh, the Chief of Army Staff, uh, Lieutenant Con uh, General uh, Tukaro Buratai, has said that uh, there has to be improved welfare package for the Army, for the military generally. Beyond rhetorics, how do we make this a reality and ensure we become more effective in this fight? Yeah, yes, I, I was making an allusion to that just now, mm -hmm. talking of technology, talking right. of intelligence. It is very important. Mm. You see, you can buy a very new car. If you don't know the manner of the car, you press the wrong button, the car will go into overdrive. Something has to happen. You can buy all the equipment. The man that will operate the equipment, what is his state of mind? I started with live free, die well. In fact, in Game of Thrones, it is even Vala, Mogoris, Vala, Duaris, all men must die, all men must serve. Mm. Fine. The military institution is a specialized security agency that is high tech in contemporary design. So it's not just wearing jackboots 
marching with your rifle on your shoulder. No, it has gone beyond that. There is a section in the army, doctrine and training, TRADOC, training and doctrine, right? Okay, that's the name. What do they do there? They are supposed to help you build your mindset. Now, the morale of the military has been down because of too much political infusion. Can I, can I, can I also come in? Belmans. You see, what is the problem today with the military is fatigue, the overstretch. Mm. But there must be cause for fatigue. I'm coming. Mm. You see, they are overstretch. How big is this nation? It's only in the last two in the last two years that we have increased from four divisions to from three divisions to seven divisions. They have to be trained. You have to arm them to sufficiently effectively hold the ground in Nigeria. And I've written a paper, and my suggestion is that we have retired men and officers that the Nigerian government is still paying for. They are in their various local governments. We should do what we did during the Nigerian Civil War, mobilizing these people to look after, to, 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 to occupy the ground. This is what we should do. We can, this is not the time to rely on, this, on the active servicemen. Mm. There are too few. Okay? We have retired troops mm -hmm. in their various places. Use the police, the army, recruit them. Let them still remain in their places. Let them be on active service. Okay. We are paid their pension. I retired since 1976. I'm receiving my pension. You can use me. Okay. You can use me. So I think under this situation where we now need more men mm -hmm. to occupy the ground, we should now call in retirees as we did during the Nigerian Civil War. The reason I ask that question, just so we're clear, is because yes. uh, yesterday I, I got to speak with a very respected and notable retired DIG. And he said, uh, on account of the allegations, of course there are counter allegations too, that uh, most of the resources are marked for the welfare of these men fighting or prosecuting this war. Um, in his words, a number of these young boys would have to die needless death. And that's worrisome. Uh, that's not something you want to go to bed with two eyes closed over. Mm -hmm. So we are asking now, how do we begin to get it right with, um, if, you, if you will, uh, morale-boosting initiatives for the men, and why we're also working on improvement of equipment for these men? Uh, Mr. Chair, may want to uh, Okay, how, how, to how long have we been in this particular theater of activity now? Nine years, from mm -hmm. 2009, that's when it began to actually escalate to this right. level. And what is the training time for the average officer? If you were to go to the academy, it would have been four to five years. If you were to talk of depot, it would have been two years. Mm. You see, the man that just left depot is not really ready for where he has been trained. There's supposed to be a way you can break him in. But there is always this gap that we have not been able to fill. In, in America, there's ROTC, Reserve Officers Training Corps. We have youth coppers. Of course, I'm not saying we should use them. But you see, the time I went for the service, I asked this question, what are we doing? They say, oh, it's like training you in case there's any national emergency. We just see this usage. I, 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 I agree with what my cousin has just said, mm. that they can prove, in fact, they should actually be the ones building morale from the background. Right. Because the government is, that's why I said, the government has not looked at this thing critically. They should look at all sectors. It's not, it's, the, the thing has become more of Nigerian army. The army is overstretched. Yesterday, I was listening to a discussion on television, and the man that spoke from there is a retired group captain. He's not a security consultant. He said, to counter this insurgency, you calculate the population of the area. It's statistical mm. and it's mathematical, it's scientific too. Population of the area, for every 1,000 civilians, you need 20 soldiers. So, using a population of 4 million, you need about 85,000 soldiers in Bono State. And do we have that? Do we have that? No. So, we, we should be looking at uh, let me reality. Come, on let the me ground. come back to what I was saying. Mm -hmm. Which it was the fatigue you was we talking need, about. What next? See, to handle the present situation, we need immediate action. That immediate action is to mobilize retirees. Mm. First of all, call in retired police officers, retired military officers to stay in their various places and look over the ground. 
Maintain the ground. Maintain the peace. Okay. As I'm been here, I know the vulnerable places. Okay. The I can flash assist. points. Okay. The dark spots. Yes. Areas. Okay. All right. We should immediately do that one until we're able to train mm. sufficient people. And there's no country that train and have the, the military, the strength of military they require. Mm. There's no country. Okay. What you have, you have very well trained that you can easily expand. Combat readiness. I can, I can take the case of Nigeria before the Civil War. The whole of Nigeria military, Air Force, Navy, um, the Army, mm. we have less than 5,000. Okay, but well, because of the good training we had, we expanded to, to, to have a million within one year. Okay, and we brought in people serving the World War, Second World War, into the military. Okay, it is after the war that they were all disbanded again. Okay, we can, we can do the same thing so that we can sufficiently hold the ground. Because the duty of the military is to hold the ground. Gentlemen, as we wrap, wrap up now, uh, in one minute each, let's look at something critical, which is also very worrisome. Uh, proliferation of small arms and, of course, uh, dangerous uh, weapons. Uh, that is one element that contributes to this very ugly and disturbing uh, narrative. How do we also curtail that uh, going forward? Let me start with Mr. Sarima. Okay, we, we go back to security of our land and sea borders. Mm. Most of these things don't come into the air. So right. land and sea. So we need to actually up our security mentality. And the, the consciousness of saying it is the business of the government should end. I'm taking it back to what the Tarkone just said again. You need to be totally involved. Security is everybody's business. When I said failure of national security, I was talking of failure of the military. National security is everybody's business. We should look at our, how do these arms come in? Can they be traced? The intelligence factor also comes in. What is the line that flows these arms into the country? Who receives them? Which country will they manufacture them? Who is their dealer? Who is the end user that receives them when they are transported? Those things can be tracked. Just as if you misplace your cell phone, it can be traced. Every arm has a signature that is attached to it whenever it is manufactured. Mm. It can be traced back to where it was manufactured. It can be linked to who bought it. Even those papers can be forged too, but forged papers also have element of forgers. So you can't trace anything. This is 2018. We can do better. The problem has been synergy, proper consideration, and proper strategization. We should look at those angles critically. Mm. Then by the time we remove it from being political to become national mm. and corporate, we will begin to make necessary progress. Can, can I, well, lastly now, uh, President Muhammad Buhari today. Can, can I say something on this? By all means, though. Yeah. You see, the arms coming to the country mm. is where corruption is a problem. Okay. From head to toe, from the seaport to everywhere, it's corruption. People know what is happening. Okay. That is one. The second thing is we should educate Nigerians to be Nigerians. When I was in elementary school in this country, I studied civics, mm. okay, so that I can be a better Nigerian. But people to the little border, what the border is just about, money, 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 okay. Do you know that in this country, you see something happening, you don't report on the agents. You say it's not your concern. You even will report to them. They don't okay. act. How about those reports to them and then they, they become they victims ultimately? It's don't all that's where corruption comes in. Mm. But you should never, we should never give up. We should train the youth. Let them start from the youth. Start from from them. But I was just going to ask you quickly, in addition to your response now, yeah. President Buhari today is meeting with uh, heads of government from uh, the Lichard Basin Commission. Uh, Basin, yes. uh, commission. What, what exactly, yes, uh, what exactly do you think will be the issues, especially regarding the uh, Boko Haram? Because they've had these meetings time and again. What is likely going to be different about today's? It's a wake-up call, mm. okay? Because you have been having a meeting with them. But this is a special one now to say that, well done, at least the activities of Boko Haram have been reduced. But they are still active. Mm. Can we do something? Can we find out? new ways of handling the matter. Okay. Just quickly, as, as at the time he was discussing with the Chief of Army Staff Conference, he gave them a new mandate mm. that it should be elimination of Boko Haram. This was on from, the, from the face of the earth. Yes. On NTA International. Is yes. that realistic? Well, it is. Let the policy be driven by necessary action 
and commitment to achieving the objective. Mm. Because if you don't set a policy standard, then you will not have something that you are driving at. So, to come here again, we don't have sufficient men on the ground. And we have to increase to the number of men. What is the they will collaborate. Unless we call in retirees who are found in every nook and corner in this country. That's what, that, is, that, is, that is the intelligence we have been talking about. Okay. So the government should use intelligence they should, properly. No, don't, they, they are not for intelligence. They will also bring intelligence mm. and they will reinforce Okay. The that that I, I, I think, gentlemen, uh, incidentally, that's the, the much time we're allowed to take on this conversation. <laughs> it's been very interesting and enlightening. I mean, all of the perspectives and context uh, we've been able to create this morning. I've been talking with two gentlemen. Uh, first here, a retired colonel uh, from the Nigeria Army. Actually, we should emphasize that uh, he left the Nigeria Army 42 years ago, retired as a colonel. Uh, that's a whole lot of uh, background there. Uh, colonel uh, Ogbebo, Paul Ogbebo retired. Thank you for coming. We appreciate your insight on this program this morning. And of course, I've also been talking with uh, a respected academic from uh, the University of Benin, Department mm -hmm. of uh, History and International Studies. Uh, Felix Osarema, thank you as well uh, for coming. Much. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day, gentlemen. Thank you. At least a few bullet points. One, the fact that uh, the government will have to uh, raise this game and, of course, as uh, President Mohamed Buhari has pledged, restrategize, or in his words, uh, retool the army uh, towards uh, effective uh, combat against the insurgency in the northeast and of course uh, security is everyone's business therefore going forward we must realize that we all have a stake in issues of matters of national security and that's going to be a full circle on the program today many thanks for investing part of your morning with us on tmid we do hope you enjoy the rest of the day i'm willie at mofrebe we'll see you again soon